introduction of our speaker tonight, and let's welcome Joe. Ah, good evening, everybody. My name is Joe, and I'm, I am an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everybody out here. I, I, there's some friendly faces I see, and that's, that makes me feel a little more comfortable. It's been a while since I've shared my story. First, I want to acknowledge Mickey and Joni. Uh, Mickey Strauss bought this place years ago, and uh, he was re really influential in my sobriety. And uh, so this is a special place to me. And also, I, I like, uh, want to thank Richard for keeping the meetings going all through the pandemic, which is pretty awesome, because he's crazy enough to do that, and I was crazy enough to come here. So I'm grateful for that. Um, also, um, boy, what did I want to say? I wanted to, oh, I wanted to congratulate uh, Taylor, was it, with a year, and Steve with six years. That's awesome. <laughs> and most of all, I want to welcome Adam and Scott. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to like, this. I'm just flying off the top of my um, spirit. And what I did was I, I was sitting there and I'm going, you know, my parents never got to see me sober and I put them through a hell of a lot. So I'm just going to dedicate anything that good that comes out of this, I'm dedicating to my parents. And I know that on some level they know that I'm doing uh, better than I was the last time they saw me. So I was born in New Jersey and I had, my parents were really pretty good folks, middle class family, you know. Ah, oh, boy, my dad had a lot of entitlement issues, which I inherited. His dad was a, like a bootlegger, gambler, bookie kind of guy, making all money, making lots of money illegally. My dad was driving around in Cadillacs when he was like 16. He thought he was the shit, you know, and um, it kind of ran down, you know. He, didn't, he did the best he could raising me, but I, I grew up thinking that I was entitled too. And my grandfather was still around, and he still had lots of money. So I'm thinking I never have to work, because I'm always looking for the easier, softer way, you know. And uh, turns out he loses all his money in the stock market. And uh, so guess what? Daddy had to go to work, and eventually I'd have to go to work. I had a hard time. Uh, I mean, when you when you have entitlement issues like I did, you just you just think the world owes you a living, you know. And uh, so I didn't really get any kind of good work ethics going early on. Uh, I was, did the best I could in school. I was a real people pleaser, real compliant up till about the sixth grade. Uh, I was a pretty good student. Um, then when I hit about 13, I guess it's like your hormones start changing and I didn't know how to handle all that too well. I was never comfortable around girls. So, uh, first time I had a drink of beer, the first beer I ever had, all that anxiety that I ever felt that was building up, just kind of just, whew, just washed off. We, we were heading to a party, and I want to I want to be on YouTube, so I'm going to stay close here. So we were going to a party, and like all that, I'm telling this is my 40 minutes of fame, folks. So uh, all the uh, yeah, all the anxiety just washed off me, and I thought that I had found the answer, you know, the answer to feel feeling comfortable in my own skin. Um, as time progressed, I thought I was just going to drink on the weekends. I made that promise to myself. You know, we just went out like most kids do on Fridays and Saturdays, at least the kids I hung out with, and we would drink. And it eventually turned into uh, doing other chemicals, you know, and, and smoke, smoking lots of weed. And, you know, it's, what, it, what turned out to be just a weekend warrior thing was turning into an, a daily thing with me. So I was really maladjusted to life and didn't really know how to keep a job or really work hard. So I always set the bar low for myself and I was got a job, so always just like washing dishes or pumping gas. That was what I would do. So my life wasn't going really well and I figured uh, my parents had moved to Florida and I stayed up in New Jersey because I wanted to stay there and be with my friends. And I was so lost, folks, I can't even explain how disconnected I was from everything. And. Uh, the best solution I could come up with was to keep all the money from the gas station I worked at. It was a graveyard shift. Just keep all the money I made, and I was going to go to California and start a new life. Because in New Jersey, uh, everything's legal, as long as you don't get caught, right? So I kept, that's, those are lyrics from a song. 
Um, so I, uh, I kept them, all the money, I put it in my so sock, $1,200, hopped an airplane, went, landed in San Diego, actually landed in Long Beach. Um, my buddy drove me to the airport, had a friend who just got out of jail in Long Beach. He hooked me up with him. I stayed at his house. And uh, he told me I should go to San Diego. I got down to San Diego. The first thing I did was get hustled by some street person because I was pretty green. And here I am downtown San Diego, not knowing a soul. Just uh, the, basically the clothes on my back and $1,200 in my sock. And this guy hustled me into buying him some whiskey. So I bought me some whiskey. And I, I just remember waking up in the storefront downtown San Diego somewhere, just dehydrated and hungover. And thinking, first thing I do is feel my sock. Oh, Thank God the money was still there, you know. So I go walking up the street, find a place to live. Right away, found a, a, like a boarding house where seven other people were living, and they all looked like partiers, so I figured I'd fit in okay, uh, even though I still felt different from everybody and, and not good enough. And um, yeah, so the first, first night there, everyone's doing mescaline and drinking beers and, I f and smoking weed, and I'm thinking, this is for me. I like this place. Um, and actually met my wife there. She was one of the gals living at that house. And I don't know about you guys, but like I'm the, I didn't have a whole bunch of experience with women. So like if I slept with her, she was like mine. She was, <laughs> she was mine. She was, she was not going to go breaking my heart, you know. And it turned out I did marry her. It's crazy. But anyway, we had, we had two kids, but from, I met her in 1980, the end of 1980. By 1984, we had two boys. But at the same time, my, my disease was really kicking in, and uh, so was hers. She was already advanced. And I started doing other, th I started shooting cocaine and snorting cocaine, started snorting it and then shooting it. And I'm telling you folks, I thought, that's it. That's why I was born. That is exactly why I was born. There, that was the, the ultimate spiritual experience up until that point. Everything else I did was just wasted time. And that's just, that's just where I wanted to stay. But it, it was never this, you know, I just chased that for years and never got that back. All I did was create a bunch of wreckage. Anyway, by the, by the time David was born, my youngest son, uh, I was nuts. I mean, I was really losing it. And uh, I would, we, would have, we would have horrible fights. I would take off hitchhike around, go up to Lake Tahoe from San Diego, come back down. When I ran out of money, she'd take me back, and it just went on and on for years. And uh, she would always take me back, and I don't know why. Uh, then it got to the point in 1986 where I was so far gone and so delusional that I said, you know what, I, didn't, I blamed everything on God. I'm like, God, I didn't ask for these kids. I didn't ask for this woman. It's all your fault. I mean, this is what I was thinking. It's all your fault. I'm going to pick up all my crap and go live with mommy and daddy because I don't know what to do. So here I am at like 28 years old going to Florida telling my folks I'm going to start my life all over again. This is after not even contacting them for the first two years I was in California. And then go, go there and they were good, good enablers. And the next thing you know, I'm just like not holding the job I said I was going to get and keeping the job and jumping from job to job, stealing from my dad and just running and gunning, just doing what I always did was just go find the guy selling weed, find the good bar to hang out with and then find the other things. And so here I am, it's not, I know, 1987, I get a DUI. I'm going to, I'm drunk off my butt and I'm driving down the medium in, in Coral Springs, Florida. I was going to head to Fort Lauderdale where I was going to get some crack and I get pulled over, and that's where I got introduced to AA, and now I'm going to talk recovery. So I got, you, I got introduced to AA in 87. They told me I had to go to 12 meetings, and I found out quickly that I could sign my own court card, so I was going to outsmart everybody. And <laughs> within a matter of weeks, you know, well, actually within a matter of days, I'm going back to the same old stuff that I was doing. And uh, my parents never threw me out, which, which is amazing. And... Um, but then I would go live on people's couches, you know what I mean? I'd say, well, my, I, I don't want to be hanging out with the folks. I'm going to sleep over to these people's house, you know? So I'm, I'm sleeping on people's couches. And uh, so then now it's 1990, and I hit a bottom, and I'm physically and mentally sick, and I'm laying in my parents' bed. 
And I had a moment of clarity they talk about, and I said, maybe the, and it's in the 12 and 12, I think. I said, I said, maybe those AAs are right. Maybe I should go back to AA. So I came back to AA on my own, and I don't remember the meeting place, but I just remember I felt really welcome there. I felt the love there. I felt like I wasn't being judged, and I was attracted to that place. But I still was so disconnected from everything, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't relate to what they were saying. And I didn't really think I was an alcoholic because I really didn't know what an alcoholic was. So, come to find out that today I do know what an alcoholic is. And it's, uh, I, have no, I have no choice whether I'm going to pick up the drink or not. And then once I pick it up, I have no control of how much I'm going to drink or what I'm gonna, where it's going to take me. So, I would half-ass do AA and uh, never get anywhere because I wasn't willing to do the work. And then finally, uh, I was a little bit sober, and my mother-in-law said, okay, so my mother-in-law, she's living in Cordes Junction, Arizona, and she says, listen, Norma, who's my wife, is in a rehab in, in Las Vegas, and I hear you're getting sober. Why don't you come meet us in, in Yellowstone? I, I rent a cabin every summer, and you're welcome to come get reunited with your boys. Now, I hadn't seen them in nine years. So I come, I drive cross, cross to, you know, I, 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 now I'm, because I'm staying sober, I'm staying dry, I should say. I'm staying dry, white knuckling it, but I keep in a job, I got money, I bought a car, and I drive the little Mazda out to, to the Yellowstone, and I meet the boys. But you know, thing is, um, if you sober up a drunken horse thief, what do you got? A sober horse thief. That was me. Nothing had really changed, you know what I mean? Nothing, I did not have a psychic change, I didn't have a personality change. And one of the things that was really demented about me was I was abusive to my youngest son, and I would do things to, to, to make him cry. And uh, I, find, I come to find, I believe it's because I was like so miserable that I wanted somebody else to be as miserable as me. So by the grace of God, um, I would shake him. And by the grace of God, he never, uh, he was damaged, but he never, uh, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but I did some damage to him. So here I am, and I find myself still having this urge to be mean to him. And I am being mean to him. And I, he does, I don't know what's going on in his mind, but it's not good. So... The only, th the only way I could deal with this is to get high again. So I went back out, started using again, not telling anybody that I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing and how sick I really am. And uh, I go back to Florida. Um, then the boys come and spend the summer with me and my parents. That was okay, but I was still being mean to David. Then they went back, they came back here and uh, the next, the following year, I moved out here to be with them. Now, the, the deal was, I'm still not telling the truth about myself. I'm not telling them that I'm still a sick individual and I have this crazy urge to want to be mean to my son and I can't stay sober. But uh, I come out here and next thing you know, get back with the wife. That wasn't the plan. The plan was for me to get reunited with the boys. But because we were both codependently sick, we got together and we, st we tried to make make it work, and we, we've been together since, but it's been a real rocky road. Um, but we started using again together in Mayer, and now I'm tweaking out, and it's really bad. So then about three months later, we move out to Prescott, where, because she's on welfare and I'm, whatever, working at a car wash, we were, were able to get these apartments on Sandretto that were real cheap, and we're partying there, well, partying, right? We're using there. And in between, I would try AA and then go back, relapse, um, in and out, in and out, doing the in and out shuffle. And by the grace of God, he kept giving me chances to come back and get it. In 2002, in the 2001, I'm tweaking out and the Twin Towers come down. And I'm so spun out, I'm like, thank God the world's finally coming to an end. Put me out of my misery. Because at this point, I don't want to live anymore. Well, that doesn't happen. So then, uh, keep on going in and out, in and out of AA for another year. And my wife gets an extreme DUI, so this 
probation officer could pop over any time. So if I wanted to smoke pot, I had to go out on the front porch and smoke pot. So I'm smoking a joint on the front porch and my cat Whitey's hanging out on my shoulder. And all of a sudden I think I hear this voice saying, why are you hiding from me? I'm like, what? And like, it's, this voice is coming from inside saying, why are you hiding from me? I'm like, I don't know. I said, I am hiding from you, God, huh? Because up till then, I'm waiting for Bob Dylan to come by in a limousine and pick me up and <laughs> take care of all my problems. <laughs> this is where I'm at in my head. That Bob Dylan's going to come by in a limo and say, come on, Joe, you don't know how to play an instrument. Come with me and join the band. <laughs> so I'm smoking that joint. I hear, God, I hear God talking to me. Why are you hiding from me? And... Uh, I threw the joint down and I went right to AA again. I put together 10 months, swore I would never use again, but I wasn't doing the work. Uh, fine, uh, got hot, got, went to my brother's wedding, stayed sober, only because my sister was there and she grabbed the champagne out of my hand when we were going to toast because I'm so uncomfortable at this wedding that the only thing I could do is maybe take a drink. She grabbed it, what the hell are you, you know, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, oh yeah, thank you, you know, because I have no choice if I'm going to take the drink or not. So I make it through there, but I get back to Prescott while my wife's doing meth, and she didn't have to twist my arm. I went and did it, and then after three days of doing that, I was losing it again, and I, by the grace of God, I came back to AA, and I've been sober ever since. That was that was the ninth of that was the September eighteenth, two thousand two, and what happened was I saw a guy that I used to buy weed for at one of the meetings, weed from, and. Kelly, he wouldn't mind me telling you his name. And so that's the only connection I can make. Well, there's somebody I know. He's sober. Maybe, I, maybe this will work for me. So that was the first connection I made. Then he tells me he's playing bass guitar for a worship band at this Christian uh, recovery center. And like, I mean, I had to be pretty desperate to go to church, you know, because I didn't really want anything to do with God or church. But since Kelly was there, I said, I'll try it. So I get there, and this really wonderful man named Bill Bennett and his wife, Diane, they ran the, a place called The Bridge. It was a Christian recovery house on White Spar. It's one of the first Christian recovery places in town. And he would take people in for free if they didn't have the money. So he asked me, he goes, you gonna, do you want to accept Christ as Jesus Christ as your Savior? And I'm just saying, I'll say anything to people, please. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, sure, I, you know, I've tried everything else. Nothing's working. So I, uh, so I said, yeah, okay, I'll, ta I'll accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Well, I didn't feel any different. Nothing seemed to be changing too much, but I, I was staying sober. I was going to meetings every day, two to three meetings a day the first year. Then someone said, Joe, you need to go get a job. I think you're hiding out in those AA meetings. And they, they called me on it. You know, I was. I needed to, I needed to go back to work. So got a job and still continued going to meetings. I got humbled enough this time around to ask for help, get a sponsor. Alcohol kicked my butt into a state of reasonableness. I asked for help, I got a sponsor and I took the steps to the best of my ability. And what happened was when I did my fourth step, I stopped blaming everybody and everything. From, I stopped, the word blame was dropped from my vocabulary. And I became accountable that day for the first time in my life. It's the first time I ever did an inventory. It's the first time I ever looked at myself. And I became accountable. And I became like a whole person that day on, on, some, on some levels. And I said, you know what? Everything, everything that ever, all my resentments, I played a part in them. Anything bad that ever happened to me, I stepped on people's toes and they retaliated. Actually, it was, I... God would show me so much mercy. If I, if I would, would have gotten what I deserved, especially that with my son, uh, like a monster would come out and just stomp me because that's what I deserved. But thank God I had a good third step. They're, they're in order for a reason. And I, I, the God that I had was a loving, forgiving God. And I knew that I was forgiven, so I had to forgive myself for everything I, I, I did. Somewhere in all this, that desire to hurt my son vanished. The desire to, to drink and use was expelled. It, the obsession was gone. Um, I used to even hurt cats. I had a cat. I used to strangle my cat. This is how, how messed up I was. I mean, this is going in and out of AA, you know. I would strangle the cat. 
anyway, I've been restored to sanity. I'm happy to report. I don't deserve it, but uh, God did a work in me. That's all I could say is God, somehow he touched my heart. He, he gave me his love, and, and I was able to... So now I'm asking for second chances. You know, I, I, I want a second chance to be a dad. I want, a, I want some grandkids even, maybe. So both kids say they're never going to have kids. Well, having parents like us, I don't blame them. But the, our older son, Joe, decided to, he's a firefighter in, in Oregon. He decided there, him and his wife, Molly, were going to have a child. So their first son, Luca, was born three years ago. And now they have another baby girl, Elizabeth. And I got to see, and Elizabeth is one year old. And I got to see Luca for the first time when he was a little over a year old. And I had a lot of apprehension and fear that maybe that psycho guy was going to come back. And it, he didn't, thank God. And um, so now I get a chance to be a grandparent. I get a chance to restore the relationship with my sons. David and I, he needs a lot of, he, I, I need to do a lot of work. I made amends to him. Uh, he doesn't remember any of that stuff, he says. Um, but I know I damaged him on some level. So I'm doing my best to be a loving dad to my son, David. Now we're like pen pals. We're start, we just started writing letters to each other. And things are good. Things are good today. And I get a chance to be a grandpa, which I, and, and I could be normal, or be a normal guy now. And that feels really good. And uh, we got another cat that looks exactly like the cat that I used to strangle. And she loves me, and I love her. It's awesome. God's let, given me, shown me. I mean, why, is, why did I get a cat that looked just like the one I was abusive to? And I get, to, I get to love on her. And she comes up to me like, you know, gives me her belly even. You know, she totally trusts me. And I totally, tr I totally trust me. And it's all because I got a God in my life. And it's all, it's all because I got beat up by alcohol enough to get willing to do anything. And then I worked these steps to the best of my ability. I made that inventory. I got honest with another person and to God and, and admitted my wrongs to another person and to God and, and myself. I humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings. Every day I've got a conscience to conscious today and I, I know when I'm screwing up and I don't like the way it feels so I make amends as quickly as possible. I, every day I'm doing uh, like 10th step in, you know, spot check inventories because I have to because there's still a lot of stuff wrong with me. You know what I mean? Every day I wake up, I need to connect with God right away. I grab a cup of coffee. I read a, the 24-hour-a-day book. I'll read a couple of spiritual devotionals. I get hooked up with God. I don't pray. I don't actually pray enough. I'm, I'm going to work on that. I'm working on my... See, I'm not into religion, but I'm into a personal relationship with God. God, as I understand him, I'm, um, I call him Jesus. So I'm working on this relationship with Jesus where I'm really trying to trust him and talk to him like he's my friend and, and know that he's got my back. And so I'm still working on that, folks. I've been sober 18 years, but i got a long way to go, you know. But I'm so glad I'm not the guy that I used to be. Um, I know I'm leaving stuff out. Um, so then I, I'm at work. I worked at, oh, this, being sober, I was allowed to work, work at the post office for 17 years. I had the same job for 17 years. I just left it. It's a long story, but I just kind of quit that place a while ago, a couple months ago. But I know God's going to work it out. I just got to do the footwork. I'll get another job. I'm collecting a little early Social Security, and everything's going to everything's going to work out. We bought a house. You know, got some material things going on, but it's mostly what's going on inside. What's going on inside right now? I'm going. Things aren't really going my way right now. I shot myself in the foot by leaving that job, even. But in one way, I couldn't stand it anymore. I dreaded going to work for a year. And so I figured I deserved to be happy, too. So maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. But um, things just, you know, there's, there's some financial insecurity going on right now. And um, my anyway, I'll keep it focused on myself. So I took some notes here. And I just wanted to, I, I was going to read all this stuff. But then I was, I was just led to just tell my story. I hope I wasn't all over the place, but there's, a, there's something in the big book that I really like. I don't have any of the big book memorized, but about six months ago or so, a fellow that I work with, Lawrence, he came in, I was in the bathroom, and he said, oh, I like your energy, dude. 
It's such a dark place here. And that made me feel so good, man, because I'm like feeling, I'm not feeling it at work anymore. And he's going, like, you no, know, you, you get like a bright light around here in this dark place. So we started talking. I, I didn't know he was in the program. Turns out he's in the program. And he asked me if I wanted to start a, a meeting with him. So we started the primary purpose group. He, he actually started it. But anyway, I, I was started it with him, primary purpose group. We meet on Friday nights downstairs right here at 7 o'clock. We also get the privilege to take that meeting into a wonderful place, a uh, recovery pl uh, place. I won't mention the name, but I get to, we get on Saturdays to go into a, re a treatment center and to take the meeting in there. And that's such a privilege, and it's so awesome. But, and so, anyway, the contempt, to pri contempt prior to investigation was my downfall all through my life. You know, I always could find what was wrong with everything without even knowing what I was talking about. But um, what I wrote down was this part of the big book where it talks about we had to quit playing God, we had a new employer, a new manager. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. More and more we became interested, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. We were reborn. And the other part I really love is on page 25 where it says, the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've, we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. And what I've learned in my tradition, our primary purpose group, is Tradition 5 states that each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And in the 12 and 12 it says, better to do one thing well than many badly. The life of our fellowship depends on this principle, the ability of each AA to identify himself with and bring recovery to the newcomer is a gift from God. Passing on this gift to others is our aim. We can't keep it unless we give it away. And I hope I hope that's what I did tonight. I hope I, uh, I hope, I hope I gave it away. I hope you all got something out of this. Um, you know, there's so many other things that probably I wanted, I wanted to say. But um, I really, do I need to keep talking, or do, how do we do this? <laughs> uh, let me see. Here. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, I think I'm going to keep coming back. You know, because I haven't got this thing. You know, I'm not cured of alcoholism, but I do have that daily reprieve. It's contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And that's nothing, that's nothing I'm taking credit for. That's because I'm, I'm learning to get out of the way and let, and let God, you know, run the show to the best of my ability, you know. And I'm a, lot better, I'm a lot better than I was. And the providence of God is amazing, and he's, bringing, he's restoring so many things to my life. You know, and I still get really short and self selfish and self-centered, you know? It's like the other day I had to laugh at myself. I'm at the light, and I'm late getting home, and there's an ambulance coming by. And I'm like, what an inconvenience. <laughs> and I thought, uh, yeah, that's how I am. I'm still like that. But at least I caught it, you know? So uh, maybe I can do a little better the next time the ambulance gets in my way, right? Anyway, that's all I've got. Keep coming back. It, it works if you'll work it. It gets better. Um, and if, you don't, if you're having trouble with the higher power, just look at the group as a power greater than yourself that's staying sober. It's okay. Whatever it takes to get you in here to stay. You know, whatever it takes for higher power, that's all up to you. Things evolve and change. You know what I mean? At least you're not God no more. As long as you're not playing God, then you, you pick whatever you want for now, and then God will work out the rest. That's all. Thank you. Let's give another big round of applause for Joe.